Good evening, everyone. It's my honor to introduce Dr. Carol Reardon as the 2022 Fortinball Memorial Speaker. She was the George Winfrey Professor of American History at Penn State, where she taught from 19, oops, is it 1997? 19, I've, I've, this is lines, right? Lines. What's the line? <laughs> 1999 to 2017. Uh, in addition to her tenure at Penn State, Dr. Reardon served as a visiting professor of history at the United States Military Academy at West Point in 1999 and 2000. She twice held the General Harold K. Johnson Professorship at the United States Army War College, and she is currently an adjunct professor in Civil War Studies and at the History Department at Gettysburg College. As a military historian, Dr. Reardon specializes in the study of the American Civil War and the Vietnam conflict. She takes a wide-ranging approach to her discipline. She excels at studying battles as well as generals. But she appreciates the importance of situating traditional military history within a cultural and social context. Her sophisticated approach is on full display in her most notable Civil War book. Pickett's Charge in History and Memory. Dr. Reardon doesn't just rehash tactical events or play Monday morning quarterback. She explores how historical narratives were created, contested, and sometimes capitulated to myth. Her other notable books include With a Sword in One Hand and Jomini in the Other, the Problem of Military Thought in the Civil War North, and Soldiers and Scholars, the U.S. Army, and the Uses of Military History. Her most significant work on the Vietnam War is Launch the Intruders. This book centers on an A6 squadron on its 1972 combat forays. As I mentioned to you before, it's very important to Dr. Reardon to just not look at military operations in isolation, Dr. Reardon did extensive research with the families and friends of those pilots. It's a, it's a book that looks not just at, again, what's happening on the war front, but it's also looking at what's happening at the home front. Dr. Dr. Reardon is, is not one of those academics who disappears in the archives for her own scholarly pursuits. She has always stayed engaged with general audiences. She is a true public intellectual. For the past 30 years, she has led countless staff rides here at Gettysburg and also at battlefields in Virginia and Maryland. And she's done it with all branches of the US military. If you have not been on a battlefield, whoa, if you've not been on a battlefield with Dr. Reardon, you're really missing out. It is an absolute treat. And you get an opportunity to do that at this year's Civil War Institute Conference. Just a little bit of marketing poll here. We'd love to see you all there. It's the second week of June, and Dr. Reardon is going to do a, it's not watered down, it's a mini staff ride for uh, the participants at CWI. And like I said, it is really something special to be on the battlefield with her. Now, Reardon is also published two important books that are battle guides to Antietam as well as to Gettysburg. She has done both of those books with Tom Vassar, and I believe that both of those battle guides published by UNC Press, I believe both of those books are gonna be for sale uh, after the talk. Reardon's many accomplishments in the field have been widely recognized by the profession. She was the first woman to be elected and then re-elected to the presidency of the Society for Military History. This is the premier professional association. And you probably guess, it's an organization that is overwhelmingly male in its membership. It is worth noting that Dr. Reardon has blazed the trail for women to pursue military history as an academic field. She has also served on the Board of Visitors of the Marine Corps University from 
1997 through 2011, and she currently serves on the board of the directors for the Gettysburg Foundation. For our close, it is worth noting that Dr. Reardon is a wonderful teacher. Her presence at Gettysburg College has been a gift to our students. <laughs> I'm somewhat amused, as you can only imagine, undergraduates aren't up on their historiography, nor should they be. They may have no idea that the person standing before them is one of the premier scholars in the country in military history. And she has just done an absolutely wonderful job with them. She has also been a trusted mentor to many young scholars. On a personal note, Dr. Reardon served on my master's committee at Penn State. When I was writing this introduction, I sent her an email. I pointed out that I wasn't listed on her resume. <laughs> she wrote back to me. She said, serving on your MA committee was such a highlight that it went without saying. <laughs> She's also a neighbor. We love to get together. We talk about our favorite kinds of mulch. Dr. Reardon, she prefers cedar. And uh, we love to loan each other power tools. You know, I just, I lied about that. I, I don't own any power tools. A historian with a power tool is a menace to society, I believe. <laughs> I can't say enough about the importance of Dr. Reardon's scholarly contributions. To have her as a mentor, and to now as a colleague, and all that she has done here at Gettysburg College in just a few years, it really is something I could never have imagined. And it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Carol Reardon. Thank you. We will not revoke your, your degree, Peter. Everything's fine. They put the lights on so much that I have a hard time seeing you out there, and that's probably a good thing. Um, what I get to talk about tonight is something that has been near and dear to my heart for many years, and that is something uh, called the concept of memory. We have it here on the title page for us, but before I delve into that, I want to tell you a story. I'm dangerous when I start telling stories. And here comes one of them. Imagine, if you will, that you are a Union veteran. You served honorably and well during the, all four years of the Civil War. And when you returned home safely, thankfully, you joined the Grand Army of the Republic, the Veterans Organization for Union Veterans. You became a member of your local chapter, your local post. You rose through the ranks of the leadership. And now, along about 1887, one of your favorite things to do is to get the weekly newsletter. It's called the National Tribune. And you go from the front page to the back, your special, your most favorite section. is a section called Fighting Them Over. You're rather amused by that section because in Fighting Them Over, veterans will pick on a certain battle and they will say, my unit was the first or advanced the farthest or did the best work. And you just like to sit there smugly going, wait a minute, I was there and no, you didn't. And it's an awful lot of fun to do that. But in April of 1887, there is a, an article that catches your eye because, well, you know, you thought you knew all the big battles of the Civil War, but you've never heard of this one. Podunksburg. <laughs> and it leaves you puzzled and you start reading it. Now, Podunksburg is apparently a small town that has uh, 10 different roads converging on it from different directions. <laughs> 10 different roads, you say, hmm. And it's all about a Union general who has just taken command of, a, of, a, of the Northern forces, and his name is Major General George Gordon Reed. <laughs> he has two subordinates that seem to give him an inordinate amount of trouble. One of them is Major General Daniel Edgar Pickles. <laughs> and then there's the other one, Major General Winfield Scott 
peacock. <laughs> and they seem inordinately interested in taking command of an eminence called Oval Top Mountain Junior. <laughs> well, I think we can see where this one's going, right? Well, after a while, our Union veteran gets a little curious about who's writing this and what's going on. And he looked up at the very top at the heading and noticed that whoever the author was, he belonged to the 107th Oshkosh Volunteers. Now, you pretty much know your table of organization, and there is no such regiment. So you look at the author's name, and you don't recognize it. It's Latin, qui bono, who benefits, for whose good. And then it dawns on you, this is a parody. Now, what is, what, what is the author trying to say? <coughs> As he continued to read the article, he noticed that the author said, my views may not exactly dovetail with history, but that's history's fault, not mine. I was there, and history didn't show up until the trouble was over. Well, it's pretty clear what our veteran here, our fake veteran, was trying to say was, I'm enjoying reading all of your so-called memories about what you did back during the Civil War, but you're making a lot of this stuff up, and that's not a good thing. We have an obligation to history and to posterity to make sure that we get the stories right, to, that we get history right. We have to have enough respect for what we did in the past to make sure we ensure accuracy. And he concluded by saying, while we are flinging our opinions over towards history's altar, expecting them to catch on some unoccupied corner. We should remember that truth is the foundation of every virtue. Well, I'm sure Qui Bono walked away from that little article hoping that the readers would listen and begin to show greater respect for history and be more accurate in what they had to write about their past battles. He was doomed to failure, of course, but at least he had put in his two cents worth. So what we have is our veteran here, Qui Bono, laying out for us two different ways to look at the past. One, we call history. And history is basically, if we wanted to define it, just simply say the past as it was. The past as it really was. It's an intellectual force. You can come to Gettysburg College and major in the field of history. It's based on evidence. There are people sitting in this audience, students in my classes, who have gotten papers back from me liberally dipped in red ink with the word evidence repeated over and over again. Don't just tell me what happened, prove it. Cite your sources, tell me where it came from. Evidence is important and critically analyzing that evidence is awfully important too. We are seeking something called the objective truth. We don't always know if we've gotten it, but there is a whole lot to be gained by the journey of doing that. The man who you see here is a lieutenant who served on the staff of General John Gibbon in Hancock's Second Corps. Lieutenant Frank Haskell, when this battle was over, sat down and he wrote a letter to his brother about what he witnessed here on the battlefield. It was a letter that extended for 20,000 words. Have you even said 20,000 words to your brother, let alone written them? Well, Haskell did, and it's a marvelous a review of the second and third day's battle. But one of the things that he will do is simply remind us over and over again that history is a hard thing to recapture. And when he says, says simply at the end, a full account of the battle as it was can never be made, it's not possible, well, I think that tells us everything we need to know. Thank you for coming. Good night. <laughs> I'm all about evidence. As a historian, or as students of history, we have to be about evidence. I've learned that uh, when somebody offers me an interpretation of the past or has an idea, I will usually ask them, what's your evidence? Almost everybody who teaches history kind of cringes at certain questions or certain answers that come back when I say, what's your evidence? If it begins with, well, my grandfather once told me, that's usually a problem. If it begins with, I read in the Killer Angels. That's oftentimes a problem. If it begins with, it's intuitively obvious to the casual observer, it's usually a bit of a problem in there somewhere. 
when you write about history, it's tough. That doesn't mean we give up, and it doesn't mean you students of mine are off the hook. What it means is that it's just a hard thing to do. All history is hard to write, but the history of battle is particularly difficult because of the inherent chaos of the event and the trauma that it inflicts. And so just to give you an idea of how difficult history can be, here are three very typical questions that any student who deals with Gettysburg runs across. And just some of the problems that we have trying to figure out what the right answer might be. On July 1st, early in, er, in the morning, G Major General John Fulton Reynolds was killed in battle. That's going to be big news. All the newspapers are going to carry it. Everybody wants to know what happened to this heroic Union general. And the news isn't long in coming. Let's take a look at how it was reported. He received a volley from some sharpshooters, and you see the rest of it there. Now, first of all, I have to ask, how bad are your sharpshooters that you need a volley from your sharpshooters <laughs> to kill the guy? That's problem number one. But this is an account from the New York Herald of July 3rd. The very next day, he's killed at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Okay, that doesn't jive with what we usually think. But he was mortally wounded and died after being conveyed to Gettysburg. Does that fit with the image that's in your head? Well, it's certainly out there in the newspapers. The very next day, Reynolds was struck by several balls and died instantly without saying a word. In that same newspaper, that same edition, was another account that said that uh, Reynolds was hit and then apparently launched into a Shakespearean soliloquy to explain <laughs> why he was willing to die for the Union cause. He was mortally wounded early in the battle, rode off the field some distance before he dismounted, and a surgeon was called to check out the wound. There were so many different accounts, including one from General Heath, the Confederate commander, who said that shrapnel from his artillery mortally wounded General Reynolds. You see the word position there. One of the things I, we almost have to do with any combat account is put the author of that account on the field. Was he there at all? And if he was there, was he in a position to see about the uh, event that he's writing about? If there are questions, if there are doubts, well, you have to uh, use your critical analytical skills to maybe back off a little bit on some of these accounts. When it comes to answering this question, we fortunately have a little bit of relief because one of Reynolds' staff officers, who was right behind him when he was hit, was there to step in and say, what's with all these accounts that people are making up about General Reynolds' death? Here's what happened, and he explained it. And it was an officer who was credible and present on the field, and now we pretty much know that one bullet behind the right ear, no talking, instant death, and there you go. But it's one of these things, perhaps you are a first-time student and you're studying Gettysburg, for the first time. And you go to the sources. You hear all this discussion about the importance of primary sources, and these are primary sources, and they lead you in all kinds of, con of different directions. History is not easy. And this is such a simple, easy, fundamental question that could easily tie you up in knots. Let's take a look at a second question. How many p Confederate artillery pieces participated in the great bombardment before Pickett's charge? it would seem logical to go to the chief of Confederate artillery. He would probably know better than anybody else. So General Pendleton, how many guns did you fire? Nearly 150, okay. For a second viewpoint, let's take a look at General Henry Hunt, Pendleton's counterpart on the Union side, who can at least make a knowledgeable judgment, and he says 100 to 125. But there are Gettysburg books that you can pick up, and it will tell you unequivocally and without any question whatsoever that exactly 113 Confederate cannons participated in the bombardment. If you trace back the source, it goes back to a letter. Primary source, great. Written by a Union infantry corporal on July the 6th. You want to know about Confederate artillery numbers and you're looking at a Union Infantry Corporal. No, don't do that. Stop it. Quit now. That's one of the things that, as a student of history, you have to do when you're checking on the credibility of your sources. 
You read it, those of you who are the readers of what we produce, it all looks and flows so easily. Think about the questions like this that we've tried to tackle just along the way. The different officer's perspective or different soldier's perspective had a lot to do with it. Perception. Before, the, uh, before Pickett's charge, there was this wonderful artillery bombardment. How long did it last? The standard account, two hours. But if you talk to the Michigan soldiers down at the left end of the Union line, their response would be, bombardment? What bombardment? So we have a baseline of zero. If you take a look at the various accounts that we have up here, the Confederates were busy and very active and involved in what they were doing, and they were saying about 20 minutes. And then on the other extreme end, you have uh, several Union regimental commanders who are, waiting, who are waiting passively for this thing to be over with, and they will say four hours. So that bombardment that we hear about either almost doesn't happen or it lasts four hours. Take your pick. And don't even get started on such things as <coughs> Uh, when did it begin? Because you can find everything from 11 o'clock to 5 p.m. It looks so easy when you read it, but when it comes right down to it, history's a kind of a tough thing to write. And it only gets complicated when we add in that second way of looking at the past. And that is something that we call memory. The majority of what I'm going to say from this point on will be about memory because it's, a, it's something that we really need to know a lot more about. In 1889, up on in, uh, Herbst Woods, Major Edwin White of the 24th Michigan is participating in the dedication of the regimental monument. And he will, he will have a lot to say about what the 24th Michigan and the Iron Brigade did that day. But toward the end of his speech, he, I, I, I like to think he paused a little bit and he said some of what you see up here. Recall, if you can, an engagement of the war and positively, positively state of your own knowledge that you passed through some field. And he went on and said, what kind of field was it? You went through a tree line. What kind of trees were it? Were in it? You remember going up an elevation. Was it steep? Was it a very easy incline? What was it? And then bottom line, he just basically says, you don't remember. You don't know because you didn't have time then to put it down in your mental memorandum book. I love that phrase. I taped that phrase to my wall when I was writing about a, a number of, the, of my projects. There are so many things that happen around us at times when there's a great deal of activity going on that we do not notice, and we don't have time to put in our mental memorandum books. And as a result, later on when you're thinking about it more, and you hear somebody say, oh, those were oak trees, you add oak trees to your story. Or they say we went through a cornfield. So you add cornfield to your story. Maybe it was, maybe it was wheat, maybe it was rye. But you heard corn, so you're going to add it in. Basically, what Major White was telling us was that maybe you shouldn't trust everything we tell you when you read our, our letters and our diaries, because an awful lot of them uh, probably contain th elements that we created to fill gaps. They, it might not be God's own truth. It just might be stuff we made up. And there were other soldiers who, when they, had a when they had an opportunity and got rather reflective, would stand back and say, you know, the battlefield is the most crowded place that people gather together, except they weren't aware of any el anybody else being there. One gentleman, one soldier up on Little Round Top said, the battlefield is filled with thousands of individual universes, each one with a membership or a population of exactly one. Everybody's going to see a, a common action, but they're going to remember it differently. And that's going to have a huge impact on the sources that they give us and the way we write about it. Now, we told you what history is. How do we define memory? And this is the way we take a, take a look at, at memory. Memory is the past as we wish it was, the past as we choose to believe it went, uh, the past as it should have been sometimes. Instead of it being intellectually based, like history, it's emotionally based. It comes from the heart. It comes from the gut. It comes, it's not a part of, of an intellectual process. 
It can be, rather than objective, it can be selective, it can be sanitized, sentimentalized, self-promoting, self-serving, a lot of S's to pick up the sibilance on the microphone, um, all kinds of good things. Memory often begins when, a, when something in the present, right now, stimulates an association. It's not an effort to reconstruct the past. It's linking back to the past because something right now makes you think back on something that happened long ago. And you try to forge a, a link even if perhaps there shouldn't be one. A lot of you have, uh, quite, have developed quite nice collections of Civil War books at home. And you've probably noticed that an awful lot of them have memory in the title. Uh, it's a fairly new idea. Whenever we have a new a concept in history, we like to explain a little bit of where it came from. So a couple of minutes on its intellectual roots. The two books on the left, of course, you might recognize one of them. Um, this is the 25th year, the 25th anniversary of the Pickett's Charge and History in Memories publication. It's almost exactly 25 years old right now. When that book came out, I just took a, a simple uh, event, Pickett's Charge, something that almost everybody acknowledges they've heard of and sort of know something about, and drilled down to see how the story developed over time. What elements of the story were there at the beginning? How did the story change? Why did it change? Who changed it? For what purpose? What elements dropped in? What elements dropped out? Uh, what does it mean today? Why does it develop the kind of, of resonance that it still has today? While I was digging down deep into one small incident, David, Professor David Blight up at Yale was writing a more broad perspective, and a lot of you I know are, have read his Race and Reunion. When these two books came out, all of a sudden memory was something that the Civil War world began to pick up on, and thus, that's why you have libraries full of books with memory in it. But where did we get those ideas? Now, if David were here, he, he would tell you his story. I'm going to tell you mine instead. Mine came from a variety of different sources. I graduated from Allegheny College way back in the Stone Age, and when I did, I graduated with a degree in biology. There was nothing that said I was going to become a professor of military history. But because of my science background, I had never lost that edge, and I began to think in terms of how does memory work as a biological process, as a neuroscience issue. How, does it, how, you know, how would the scientists talk about this? And I got into the study of memory through the sciences. And from there, I discovered others were, were taking a look at the, the, the notion of memory as, as well from still more uh, different directions. <coughs> Most of us who work in the field of memory would say that our intellectual godfather was a Frenchman by the name of Maurice Halbwax. He was a, a sociologist and a philosopher, not a historian at all. And he talked about what he called collective memory, the stories, the values, the, uh, the heritage that different societies put together that changed over time to meet uh, changing needs. Uh, he was a uh, scholar in the 1920s and 1930s. He was uh, captured by the Nazis and actually died in Buchenwald in, in 1945. But his book on collective memory became a standard in fields other than history to talk about ways of dealing with the past. For the historians to discover that book, it was like being given a key to unlock uh, the way other societies and other eras looked at the past, and it helped to inform me. And once I had some basic knowledge about that, I started looking for signs of it in other books that appealed to me for one reason or another. When I took a look at a book by Michael Kamen called Mystic Chords of Memory, I was drawn to it because, of course, it comes out of a Lincoln speech. And it took a look at the uses of popular memory throughout um, the, the whole course of, of American history. And there were some useful things in there. But an awful lot of my insights were coming from the work of British military histories. The two books that you see up there, Richard Holmes' Acts of War, and, Mike, and John Keegan's The Face of Battle, were awfully important about talking about the way memory, especially memory in battle, works. Holmes gave us an important phrase. He said, most of us live our lives on the great gray level plane of existence. That sounds dreadfully boring, does it not? We live our lives on the great gray level plane of existence. And he said, mostly what we remember are those 
peaks and valleys, those prime experiences that extend above or below that great gray level plane of existence. He says, when you go into battle, you're not going to remember every step you took or, any, or just every action you took, you, you took when you were on the firing line. What you're, you're going to remember are the great successes or the great failures, the horrible things you saw, the, the first time you experienced something, the, those peaks and valleys. That's what you're going to remember. And it helps to shape how you read an awful lot of soldiers' letters and diaries. You're not reading what happened to me, but just those little bits and pieces that somehow stuck in memory, the peaks and the valleys, not the consistent, constant experience. John Keegan's book, The Face of Battle, does something, something similar, but engages all your senses in the process. One of the books that I, I've always loved, and I still use in my military history class today, is E.B. Sledge's With the Old Breed. It's about the United States Marines in the Pacific. And it seems like an odd source for some ideas that might impact a book about Pickett's Charge. But he was a combat Marine, and he talked about the impact of various experiences in, in Peleliu um, on, on the way he, he thought about the past. In his post-military career, E.B. Sledge became a teacher of biology. So he had a way of bringing all these ideas together and talking about uh, memory as a, an individual uh, biological process, but then expanded it to its more uh, recognizable social forms and how we use it to uh, reconstruct past events. So that's where an awful lot of these ideas come from, a variety of different sources. And so what we run into are, uh, well, how do, how do we deal with, with, with memory whenever we're trying to write about the past? One of the things about memory, of course, is its selectivity. And sometimes that's um, the, the way we deal with the source material that we have, whether it be newspapers, accounts, think about the Reynolds thing, or the official reports. Every one of us in this room who does anything with the American Civil War ultimately ends up using the official records of the War of the Rebellion. And we use them like it's the Bible itself. And we, t we hardly ever really challenge the validity or, uh, of the insights that come out of those reports. I would suggest we need to be a whole lot more careful about using those things. They are not the end all and be all because they are the product in many cases of memory. There's information that gets in there, there's information that does not get in there. And even though Every officer who writes a report knows that it's going to be the document of record. There are just so many opportunities for important information to be missed. If you're trying to recollect what you saw in combat, if you're trying to re recollect what you did in combat, the chances are very good you're going to miss most of it. As Major White had said, much of the planning and most of the, most of the doing never actually get into the reports. If the reports don't tell us a whole lot, then those of us who, who end up writing the histories are likely to miss a whole lot as well. And when it comes down to selectivity, the veterans themselves would get, became extremely agitated at the first generation of historians who tried to write about Gettysburg. If you were a veteran of the First Corps or the Twelfth Corps, you especially had a bone to pick with almost every historian who wrote an early uh, book about Gettysburg. In the case of the First Corps, you had lost General Reynolds. He was dead. General Doubleday, his successor, got relieved of command. And General Newton, who took over, wasn't in command of the troops in battle. And as a result, there was not a senior voice that could speak to what the First Corps contributed to the battle. And the First Corps always felt that they had been left out, that their contributions had been dismissed or demeaned, and never felt that they had been treated fairly. The 12th Corps was even worse when it came right down to it. The monument that you see on the left, the 123rd New York, is up on uh, Culp's Hill. And if you take a look at it, well, that's Clio, the muse of history, writing down the truth to make sure that everybody remembers that the truth is the most important thing. What's their specific, specific gripe? When General Meade issued his report, his initial report about the Battle of Gettysburg, 
He wrote a little bit about the first core, tons about the second and third and fifth, and even the sixth core that really didn't do that much, and even the 11th core, but didn't have that much to say about the 12th. General Slocum had call, called him on the carpet, had taken him to task, and simply said, you know, you, you did an injustice to brave men and defrauded them of well-earned laurels. You wrote the report of record, and you left us out of it, and basically threw a major hissy fit right at General Meade. Now, General Meade was known for his short temper, and he could have snapped back in, uh, in, with equal fervor, but he did not. For once, Meade was fairly calm and, and measured and said, well, General uh, Slocum, I did not write about you because I never got a report about you, about what your men did. Oh, and you were supposed to write it. <laughs> well, General Slocum uh, basically exacted what he thought was satisfaction. He said, I will get the reports and give them to you, and then I expect satisfaction. And General Meade says, you get me what I need, I will rewrite the report, and I will even see that it is published to make sure that, in fact, the record has been uh, rewritten to your satisfaction. This is much nicer than Meade usually is. And Meade's not usually that kind of patient. So Slocum goes off in a huff, gets the paperwork, and Meade follows through. He was a dutiful officer, he rewrote the report, he gave credit where credit was due, but probably the damage was already done because first impressions are huge. And the 12th Corps did not get a lot of press in the first report. And as a result, when the battlefield was being laid out and monuments were, uh, the locations for monuments were being identified, the 12th Corps is pretty sure we're gonna get the short end of the stick on this too. And so when you drive around Culp's Hill, newly restored, beautiful to look at right now, all of a sudden we can start seeing just how closely packed all those 12 core monuments are right now. The 12 core wanted to make sure that their voice got heard. And if that meant they had to build their monuments first and in great profusion, they were gonna do it. They were gonna get their retaliation. And of course, they will do it in a way that will promote their memory, the story they want to tell, as opposed to the one that history wanted to tell. So a lot of times selectivity is going to uh, have an impact on the way that history gets written. And sometimes what you have is not the memory of what happened, but the erasure of something that happened. At Gettysburg, there's lots of stories, but just to give you an idea of a story that probably you haven't read about, when we were working on the field guide to Gettysburg, we ran across a story that frankly just stopped me cold because I hadn't heard of it. We're looking at the monument to the 57th New York Infantry. It's in the wheat field. And there was a story of a soldier who, like probably thousands of soldiers on that battlefield, got dislodged from their unit. They just simply discovered all of a sudden they did not have the will to continue, withdrew from the field in the, in the heat of the fight. This was a soldier who returned to ranks voluntarily after the battle was over apologized for his departure from the field. But because his absence had been reported officially, he had to go through the Army's judicial process. He was court-martialed. He was found guilty of desertion in the face of the enemy. And a guilty plea is followed, of course, with a sentence of death. In many cases, if a soldier had, been, had performed honorably and well up to that one point, the possibility of clemency exists. We all know that Abraham Lincoln Offered, er, offered clemency to a number of soldiers who were convicted of uh, various and sundry crimes and, and uh, sentenced to be executed. That did not come through for this soldier. And in December of 1863, in a field down in Virginia, an entire division of the Second Corps was lined up in, a, in three quarters of a square for the execution of three soldiers, including this one. You can see from the comment here that the regiment did not feel good about this. This was not a shirker, this was not a bad soldier, this was one man who had a very bad day on July 2nd, and owned up to it and came back, and they all thought he should have been given a second chance, but that's not the way the military justice system worked. You will see that they decided that they would not dishonor him by putting his name out there and make it public. They wanted to account for something that happened in their regiment but they wanted to do it in a way that, okay, there's some things 
we don't need to tell you. And that was, a, that was an interesting judgment call on their point. What other stories did soldiers decide we didn't need to know about? I'm sure that there's a lot more of them. But when you run across one, and it's easy to go into the regimental roster and find the name of the soldier in this case. But they decided not to name him, so I'm not going to tell you either. So we'll let that little piece of history just fade away. In time, memories, memory shifts from individual memory to corporate memory, to group memory. And probably one of the most famous memories to come out of the Battle of Gettysburg is the whole notion of the high water mark, the turning point of the battle. I hear it every day. It gets into the public media all the time, even now. Gettysburg was the turning point of the war. This was something that began right after the battle. A lot of you have seen the newspapers right after the Battle of Gettysburg with headlines like Waterloo eclipsed. And the double, uh, double whammy of Gettysburg and Vicksburg certainly had that kind of, uh, of press coverage all over the North. And there would be some even then who would say the fate of the Confederacy has been sealed. And Charles Carlton Coffin, whose quotation you see there, was a, a prominent Bostonian journalist. And he's going to use that phrase, a turning point in history. There will be others, William Swinton of, of New York, who will use uh, the phrase of the high watermark. And others will use similar phrases that we use all the time, probably not well, probably not accurately, probably with not as much nuance as we, we should. But it started early on. John Batchelder is somebody who probably a lot of you recognize over there on the, on the left-hand side of the screen. And he became the, uh, the superintendent of tablets and monuments on the battlefield. He was all about historical accuracy. There were Union veterans who took this guy's name in vain constantly because they didn't like his editing of what they wanted to put on their monument or where they wanted to locate their monument because he was always talking about the importance of accuracy. But in this one case, he did something different. He decided that he was going to buy in to the notion of Gettysburg as the high watermark. Partly, he has built a hotel whose rooms he wants to fill. But in, other, in every, every other way, he's going to promote this notion. And he's going to be behind the, the building of the big bronze book at the angle today. It's interesting that the man who did so much to promote uh, the whole concept of historical accuracy here at the Battle of Gettysburg is also responsible for one of its most vivid memories. Probably the most entertaining part is when, when you found, kind of like our, like Qui Bono did, that everybody has an opinion about who really deserves the greatest credit for the greatest victories and the greatest achievements on the battlefield. There are many cases that all of us already know about. But here were some of the ones that kind of slipped through. Their fight wasn't successful. Their fight didn't become part of the memory of Gettysburg, particularly. Colonel William F. Perry, 44th Alabama, was one of few Confederates who actually came back multiple times after the war was over. And he came because he had a special quest. He'd commanded the 44th Alabama here at Gettysburg, and they fought down at Devil's Den. What he was upset about was all those blasted Texans who always claim credit for taking Devil's Den. It's always about Texas. It's always about Texas. He would come and he'd pick a fight with anybody who wants to fight and wants to say that Texas did this. One time he was confronted by a gentleman who said, I agree with you. It was not the Texans. Finally, somebody who agrees with me. Oh, no, sir, I don't agree with you. It was the 17th Georgia that deserves the credit for capturing Devil's Den. And another near fist fight ensues. This is a man who tried very hard to take the standard narrative of, of one part of the Battle of Gettysburg, the first Texas capture of Devil's Den, and turn it into something that fit his ideas a lot better. In this case, he, doesn't, uh, he does not succeed, but boy, he was, he was gonna go down swinging as, as, as much as he possibly could. To, to get it his way. And he's far from the only one. In the center, we have the Vermont State Memorial. If there is one Union state that pretty much wanted to claim credit for winning the Battle of Gettysburg, it is the state of Vermont. 
Now, if you think about it, there's really only two big units from the state of Vermont here, the 1st and 2nd Vermont Brigade. The 1st Vermont Brigade was in the 6th Corps and their monuments on, in, in between uh, the two round tops and was actually in a reserve position. It's the 2nd Vermont Brigade that really was in the action here. They were soldiers who had enlisted for nine months. And at the time of Gettysburg, they were at about the eight and a half month point. What have they done during their nine months? Nothing. If they're gonna have anything to brag about when they go home, it's gonna be what happens here. They are involved in both the second and the third day, and especially not notable on the third day for their effort to crack in the uh, right flank of Kemper's brigade during the repulse of Pickett's charge. But my Lord, if you read what they wrote about it, they single-handedly stuck their noses out in the field, far out ahead of anybody else, went all the way down to the Emmitsburg Road, if, it, if you really wanted to know, and opened fire on Kemper's, left, Kemper's right flank and sent them fleeing. Pickett's men were on the verge of success. They were penetrating the, into the Union line. The whole Union line was about to crumble except for these few hundred men from Vermont who identified the problems and without orders stuck their noses out there and hurled back the Confederate column. If that's not dramatic enough, we'll add some more adjectives. And we are going to get this out in print by the late 1860s and we're gonna keep throwing it at you until sooner or later you start nodding your head and saying yes, Vermont is the, uh, is the true victor of, of, of here at the Battle of Gettysburg. <coughs> the Vermonters took it so completely over the top that even in the uh, fighting them over columns in the National Tribune, soldiers from all over the North finally were writing in saying, Vermont, tone it down. Please tone it down. We admire what you did. We especially admire the 1st Vermont Brigade that actually did a whole lot of fighting in the Civil War. We're glad you put in your nine months. We're glad you were here at this moment. But please, get a grip. And, and they really told the Vermonters that they needed to shut up in a big way. But my favorite story has to be Captain Jacob Turney. Captain Jacob Turney is not going to get down into the pits of discussing the finer points of memory. If he doesn't like the narrative, he's just gonna make up something else that works for him. It's gonna have no foundation in fact whatsoever. Picture this. It is July 3rd. The attack is underway. The Confederate troops are getting closer and closer to the, to the angle. Things are tense. We're almost ready to go over the wall. Pickett's men are coming up on the right, and Turney's in uh, Fry's brigade. He's one of those Tennesseans. He's on the right flank of Pettigrew's men. And apparently he must think that he is the senior officer present because right as we get close to the wall, here comes a horseman riding up from behind us. He seems totally unscathed by the hail of bullets that is falling around us. And he rides up to us and he said, who is the senior man present? And everybody pointed to me. Captain Turney. The man got off his horse and came up to, to me and saluted and said, I come from Robert E. Lee's staff. We've been watching you. We know that you are behaving gallantly. You must press forward, continue the attack. And then he saluted, got on his horse, and apparently rode safely back. Now, you are at the wall. You're about to go over the wall. What are you going to do to seal that victory? You're gonna call a meeting of your company commanders. And you're gonna bring them all together. And you're going to relay General Lee's message to you. You must take them over the wall. And apparently, they turned around and did just that. As it turned out, Captain Turney finds himself going over the wall with General Armistead right on his right, right next to him on the right. And as they get over the wall and General Armistead gets hit, he falls into Captain Turney's arms. <laughs> Turney's making stuff up, folks. He seriously is. But if you want to read it, go to Confederate Veteran Magazine in 1900 and you'll find the full story. 
and un it's under a heading that says, Captain Jake's proven that he was there. There were so many stories like this that were made up about Pickett's charge or, or, or involvement at the Battle of Gettysburg. If you think this one was good, some of the stories about who was that sharpshooter who, who shot General Reynolds is, al is also pretty good. There were fist fights in Alabama old veterans' homes over who actually fired the shot that killed General Reynolds. The effort for, for, to gather battle laurels is a, it was a pretty intense thing, and none of it was founded on that foundation of history or the foundation of truth that's the, uh, the basis of all virtue. Now, as time went on, these... Uh, these memories would coalesce in different ways and present us with four frameworks for memory. The first one, reconciliation, is the framework that's most often associated with Gettysburg. Face it, all of us have gone into the visitor center, especially the old visitor center, and seen the large cutouts of old veterans in blue and old veterans in gray reaching out across the stone wall and shaking hands. National reconciliation unquestionably going on here. The first big reunion here at Gettysburg between the blue and the gray happened in 1887, during the 24th anniversary of the battle. It took place between the survivors of the Philadelphia Brigade and the, fought the survivors of, of Pickett's division, soldiers who had actually fought each other on July 3rd at Gettysburg. The, the reunion was going to be on July 3rd on the very ground where they fought. It's kind of nice to be here right now because when the Virginians arrived, they arrived at the train station next door. They marched up the road right outside this building here. And when they got to the town square, just right up here, uh, the Union veterans greeted them by saying, we welcome you because you were brave soldiers in war. We welcome you because you are true citizens in peace. They didn't want to talk about the causes of the war they didn't want to talk about the conduct of the war. They wanted to talk about moving forward into the future jointly. And if Northerners could forget what the war was all about, well, Southerners could actually make an admission as well. You see what Colonel Ilett has to say here. Colonel Ilett had commanded one of Pickett's regiments in, in the charge. And when he can say that above the ashes left by the war and over the tomb of secession and African slavery, we can move forward into, into a new future, that was really a remarkable statement for a Southerner to make. He would pay for his apostasy. He would almost be blacklisted in the, in the, in, uh, among Southern veterans. But it was a wonderful reunion, almost. If we take a look at this little monument that you see here, one of the things that Pickett's men wanted to accomplish when they were here on their visit was to build a monument to, to, to their comrades who fell in the charge. Fine, said the Northerners. Where do you want to build your monument? Inside the Union line, um, no, you can't do that. We won the war, we won the battle, you can't build it there. So Pickett and his, Pickett's uh, survivors said, great, we're not coming. In order to push the concept of reconciliation forward, the men in Philadelphia did a, a rather interesting thing. They raised the funds. That stone is made out of New Hampshire granite. Northern stone, northern money, dedicated to a Confederate general. When they gave the speech, they dedicated it to the spirit of the American volunteer soldier and did not make uh, distinctions between Northerners and Southerners. Reconciliation, the hands across the wall. That was in 1887. When word of this reunion here got out, both North and South, the reaction was immediate and very strong, especially in the North, where they simply said that uh, the whole notion of you know, just bygones be, be, be bygones was something that did not really work for them at all. And so there was a no, another framework for uh, talking about the war that became very popular, and that was something that you would find in the North that we, des that we usually call unionism. Governor John Foraker of Ohio was one of the leaders of this movement. We don't hear that much about him, and I sure wish we did, because he does not mince his words and if you take a look at, at the quote there, that's awfully powerful. The war for the defense of the nation's life was right, wholly right, eternally right, and the war made to destroy the republic and build up the slave power, wrong, wholly, and eternally wrong. 
There would be others out there saying, all this God knows which side was right Bosch is a bunch of crap. And basically said, the, 19, the 1888 Silver Anniversary Union had, had, uh, had to be something more than a Virginia love fest. It had to get back to the, the real root causes, and it was a war that was fought for, for the uh, preservation of the Union. You could find this expressed in other ways as well. The monument you see in the middle there is the monument to the 57th New York, Pennsylvania. It sits in the, in the yard of, of the, the Sherfy Farm. And if you take a look at the monument dedication speech that they gave there, they said pretty specifically, an awful lot of our soldiers who were captured here at the Sherfy Farm were taken back south. And a lot of them died in the prisons in Richmond and even in Andersonville in 1864. And after recalling all of their comrades who died in southern POW camps, the orator of the day intoned, for this nation, there was something worse than war. The dissolution of the Union was worse. Slavery was worse. Rather, these things in the name of all the Union soldiers uh, living and dead, I, I don't say peace, I do not say reunion. I say war. The war was worth it. He doesn't want to talk about reunion. And even today, as you go across the battlefield, look closely at the monuments to see why they fought. The Pennsylvania Monument, very clearly, they fought for the preservation of the Union. Take a look at the monument to the 28th Massachusetts of the Irish Brigade. Go behind the monument to the 42nd New York, and you will see preservation of the Union. It's a very unusual thing to see anything else but preservation of the Union and defense of the flag as something that's important to Northern veterans, even in the face of all this discussion about national reunion. We might have monuments here like the peace light, peace eternal in a nation united, but there were gonna be Southerners and there were gonna be Northerners who were going to say, not so fast. Here's some of the Northerners. Here's the Southern version. Now this is something that all of us here, uh, hear about even now, the uh, continuing, continuing uh, appearance of the, whole, the old lost cause notion. The Civil War was not about slavery, it was about states' rights. Slavery was not a horrible system or oppressive system. Uh, most slaves were happy, slaves even fought for the South. Uh, all that, the, that, the, those kinds of, of, of ideas that are still around today. But one of the things about this lost cause notion and, and all these different causes was that they were oftentimes subject to very specific contexts. I found this one particularly fascinating. What you're looking at here is a badge that the United Confederate Veterans issued to those who went to the 1917 National uh, Reunion. Back in 1915, two years before this, the leaders of the United Confederate Veterans had reached a really important decision. They were gonna have their National Reunion in Washington, D.C. For years, Southerners have been talking about taking Washington and now, in 1915, they're getting ready to do just that. They were enjoying this. We're taking Washington, folks. They were planning to be there in June of 1917. What happens in April of 1917? That's when we declare war, we get involved in World War I. That left the United Confederate Veterans in a bit of a conundrum. We want to go to Washington, but do we think we should go and talk about uh, the Civil War and the Confederacy in the capital of the United States while we are a nation at war. They, I, I would like to have heard some of these discussions because most of them have not been preserved. But when they finally decided to come to Washington, the United Confederate Veterans issued this badge. If you take a close look at it, that's the shield of the Union up on top. That is the eagle of the, of the Union, that's the capital. You don't see a single Confederate flag involved in any of that, and you see the United Confederate Veterans Seal. It says, uh, the little writing that you can see on there says something, we, we answered the call before, if our nation calls us again, we will, we will answer. It, it sounds almost like reunionism in 1917. That's fine right there. But some of these same individuals who went to Washington in early June 1917, made the short trip up to Gettysburg just a couple days later for the dedication of the Virginia Memorial. 
There it was a little bit different. Down in Washington, there would almost always be somebody from the War Department to say something about, um, there was no, uh, th we, we're not gonna pay attention to the causes, we're not gonna pay attention to the conduct, we're going to look forward to a future joined together. When you get to Gettysburg, you're still gonna hear an introduction like that. But when it came time to dedicate that monument, it was a pure lost cause speech. And the quotation that you see there, it was not slavery, it was the slave trade that was branded as the sum of all villainies, was part of a Southerner's speech who said that the real evil force was not the slave power, it was not uh, slavery that was the problem, it was Northern merchants, the Northerners involved in the slave trade who brought the slaves to us who were the real evil force in American history. What started out as a Southern speech became an anti-Northern speech in a very big way. Trying to shape, reshape the narrative in a way that worked very well for Virginians and hardly for anybody north of the Mason-Dixon line. The last one, emancipation for a very long time was a very difficult element to put into the Gettysburg story. Because no, no uh, African American, uh, no, col no United States colored troops regiments fought at Gettysburg, we don't have an organized black military force here as part of the story. We have plenty of Teamsters, we have plen plenty of cooks, but most of the black men who served with the armies here were not the ones who were gonna leave diaries or any other kind of traditional entry that we would use in, in our historical research. For a long time, the black story at Gettysburg was one that got written out. But recent changes have, have begun to make a difference here. The National Park Service in the revitalization of the James Warfield House is adding a dra dramatic new element to the story. Our understanding that the fight here at Gettysburg was not just between armies, but armies that fought on homes, homesteads that, beyond, that belong to many uh, local civilians. There's a civilian story and some of them are black. We're learning more about the background of uh, the Confederate invasion of Pennsylvania that included capturing northern freeborn black individuals and sending them back south to be sold into slavery. That was once part of the story. It was in the newspapers in Chambersburg on the 8th of July, 1863. But an awful lot of the stories about black men being taken south and sold into slavery got dropped out of the historical narrative back in the time of Jim Crow. It was gone for a long time until it was restored, not by the pro professional academics like myself, but by some of our students. Some research done by Gettysburg College students rediscovered the old fashioned sources that talked about what had happened in 1863, brought them back for our consideration today, and now we have a new way of looking at the Gettysburg campaign in ways that we hadn't for over, over a century. We're playing with the memories. We are defeating memory. We're adding parts of history back into the story, and that's part of our obligation as well. Whenever the memory of, a, of, an act, of an action like the Battle of Gettysburg takes root, a change begins to occur as we move away from it in time. As future generations go forth and think about things that happened before they were born, it's harder and harder to make a connection to them. And so ultimately, instead of talking about history and memory, we begin to talk about heritage and legacy and things that have a longer duration to them. And this is gonna happen for Gettysburg as well. It's gonna happen in poetry. One of the best things I'm doing for you tonight is not reading poetry. Because some of the poetry that, is, that pops up after the war is just so awfully bad that, you know, I like you folks, I'm not gonna do that to you. So let's take it in another direction as well and take it to artwork. If we take a look at Rother Mel's painting on the, on, the, uh, on the left, it's a very traditional kind of battle scene. It shows, to some extent, some glory of war. If you follow the color scheme, the, the men in the center wearing white shirts tend to be Union soldiers. An awful lot of you are collectors of Civil War art over the past 20 and 30 years, and we saw a change that featured Confederate soldiers as those involved in the uh, military action at Gettysburg, not Union soldiers, because studies have shown that paintings featuring Confederate soldiers sell a whole lot better 
than Union soldiers, and so the change. Maybe some of you are a bit astounded, as I was initially, when Mark Bradford's Pickett's Charge came out in 2017. It's a stunning piece of work. It's one of uh, eight different panels, and it looks like uh, modern art gone crazy until you learn more about the story. And you find out that, uh, well, it's, it's mixed media, and it's supposed to de-glamorize the whole notion of uh, the glory of war. And it, by looking at it up close, what you see are tears in, and rips and ways that link one generation of painters to another and one scene from another. If you get down to the base of this photo, uh, of this piece of artwork, you get to Paul Filippito's cyclorama painting at the foundation of it, and you see tears and rips that, that take it through um, several decades and even centuries of time and show how uh, some of the questions and some of the issues that were raised during the Civil War era were still uh, unanswered and still very much germane to our national conversation today. It's a stunning piece of work that I first looked at it, shook at my head and walked away. But something made me turn around and take another look. If you had that as your first reaction as well, call it up on your, on your laptop and take a look at it again and look a little bit deeper and you're gonna find out that there's a much bigger, much more intense story about, um, well, how to interpret um, the, our past through artwork, even using formats like this. We find it in something like music as well. There was sheet music about Gettysburg. I didn't know that until I started digging into it. Had to put the Gettysburg soundtrack in there because face it, there's a certain percentage of people in this audience that have it on your CD player in, in the car right now, if you still have a CD player in your car. One of the weirdest experiences, one of the most unusual experiences I ever had on this battlefield concerns music. Back in the year 2003, I was contacted by the education director of the Philadelphia Philharmonic. He explained that they had been doing an exchange program with the uh, Minnesota Orchestra of Minneapolis. And after a successful venture, they wanted to put together a piece of music that brought together the, um, something that was important to both states, Minnesota and Pennsylvania. Somebody had given them Richard Moe's book uh, about the first Minnesota at Gettysburg, and they were really intrigued by that story. But they wanted to see the ground for inspiration about the music. And so somebody had linked them up with me, and I came to show them around the first Minnesota sites of Gettysburg. I intended to go to the big first Minnesota monument from the second day, take them to the smaller monument where the remnant of the first Minnesota helped to repulse Pickett's charge, and then go up to the National Cemetery to see the urn that was dedicated in 1867, the first uh, monument up in the cemetery. Imagine my surprise when I meet the group, and my instructions for the day is, not to tell the historical story in dispassionate, professional, academic prose, but to tell it with as much energy and intensity and emotion as I could possibly muster. That's not what we're trained to do, but I went into full drama mode on this one and got out there and started telling the story. Had a blast doing it, by the way. But the reaction after I did it was the thing that caught my attention. As they turned to get back on the bus, they divided it into small groups, the percussion group, the strings, the reeds, the, uh, uh, the brass, and they're pounding out little cadences or humming little tunes based on whatever they pulled away from what I had talked about. I'd never been put in that kind of a uh, situation before, and I remember, I just remember at the time thinking that I had just become one of the purveyors of memory because what I was doing, they were translating into music. They produced an 18 minute, three movement piece of music to commemorate the first Minnesota fighting on Pennsylvania ground. And I still look back at that as one of the more awesome things that I've ever gotten to do. But again, it's not about the history. It's about what we want to remember about that moment when those two states, when the fate of those two states came together on the sacred soil of, of Gettysburg. Now, I bet if a lot of you put your hands in your pockets right now, you're going to come up with a quarter that looks something like this. 
And I took a look at this quarter and I say, you know, this pretty much, I could have saved us a whole lot of time by simply handing out to each one of you one of these Gettysburg quarters and saying, everything I want to say is on the back of this quarter. We see in the artillery piece the history, Cushing's battery right there. We see in the background the Kadori Farm, and we know that the Kadori Farm is, uh, the, the, represents the civilian story. We want to hear that. And then we see the monument to the 72nd Pennsylvania. And if ever there is a monument to memory on this battlefield, it's that monument to the 72nd. Remember what history said, what, what John Batchelder says, you place your monument on your line of battle. Because we cannot always assess how far forward any unit moved. We can't go and place your monument where you want to at the expense of some other unit's um, experiences. But the veterans of the 72nd were not happy with the placement of their original monument in the second line of battle. They had moved forward. They wanted to commemorate their action repulsing picket. So in true American fashion, they had gone to court. They sued the, uh, the, the park administration at the time in order to have their monument placed farther forward, and the superior court agreed with the veterans. <coughs> so when we look at this quarter, we see the power of history in the artillery that is there. We see this full story, the one that embrace, embraces not just the citizens or just the soldiers, but the citizens as well, and brings together this historic, everything on this historic ground. And we have this testament to memory, the monument that's placed where it has no business being if we're respecting the truth of history. So, yeah, I got that. I can't pass up, or I can't bring this all together until I do one more thing. And that is, once you, know, once you start getting farther and farther away from the event, the ability to connect a historical event to modern relevance gets more and more difficult. And as a result, a lot of times when I go into my classroom, I try to find ways to make today, or to make that time period speak to today. I try to find a bridge some way that 1863 and 2022 can speak to each other. And apparently, American entrepreneurs try to do the same thing. So I'm not too upset when I see a sweatshirt like that, the Gettysburg Address. If you were up in the cemetery earlier today, like I was, you heard some impressive language about what this living document means and what the, what, how it helps to make this place just so incredibly special. But for some individuals, the power of Lincoln's message gets watered down a bit, or even more. If you really want an adventure, Go out and take a look. I challenged my class to do this, and a few years ago they did. I said, go out and find the Gettysburg souvenir that has, that has Gettysburg on it, or the Gettysburg address, that has absolutely nothing to do with a historical event, but somehow, in order to sell something, they put Gettysburg on it. I'm saving you this one. But they found a, a pair of Gettysburg Address yoga pants. <laughs> Go out and find it, it's worth t checking it out. But what does that say about the language or, and the importance and the power of the events of the past and their ability to come down to the, to the, to the current generations? I worry about it sometimes, there, that there's some uh, historical shorthand, there's some historical literacy, there's some historical references that we sort of understand and appreciate have something to do with something happened, something important that happened in the past, but we don't have a clue what it really is. Gettysburg Address yoga pants? Really? Back in April, during the NFL draft, I had a nagging suspicion that the day would come when we were going to see a headline that looked like this.
I just had a hunch that somehow, some way, somebody was going to expect that people were going to be able to respond to Pickett's charge, and we'd be getting this. Sometimes I'm not happy when I'm right. And this was one of those. I do like that one, by the way. So what that tells us, what, what, well, what does all this tell us? Well, it tells us that there are two forces out there. Those of you who write history, like I do, we have to be a little bit more on, on our game to make sure that we separate items, resources that we use that are the product of history and which are the product of memory. And where do they blend? And where do we draw the lines? For those of you who read those things that we write, read them carefully. Challenge us gently about what we write to see if, in fact, maybe, we, maybe you see something we don't see. I guess the last word should, be beyond, should belong to uh, Lieutenant Haskell again. Lieutenant Haskell wrote that wonderful letter, and he concluded it with this. By and by, out of the chaos of trash and falsehoods that the newspapers hold, out of the disjointed mass of official reports, out of the traditions and tales that come down from the field, some eye that never saw the battle will select, and some pen will write what will be named the history. And then he added one more thing. With that, the world will be, and if we are alive, we must be content. There's a part of me that shakes my head and say, in, in kind of depressed way says, yep, that's the way it is. Historians are bound to become horribly frustrated over time. A lot of us get cynical and skeptical, skeptical over time with our inability to reach truth that truly satisfies us. Do we have the complete story? Have we gotten it absolutely right? On the other hand, with that, the world will be, and if we are alive, we must be content. Do we have to be content that we've done the best that we can with history? No. And in this, the, best, the, the last word will belong to General Longstreet. Are we done writing the history of Gettysburg? Right? Is there nothing less left for us to write about? Can we not get closer and closer to the truth? Are we done? On the 8th of April, 1865, Robert E. Lee asked General Longstreet, is it time to quit? Is it time for us to surrender? Is it time to give up the field? And what did he say? Not yet. And with that, we'll go.